On behalf of the World Affairs Council and the Marines Memorial Association, I am Chris Starling, and I will be your moderator for this evening, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's guest. Dr. Sean McFate wears many hats. He is an associate professor at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. He also teaches national security policy at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, as well as an adjunct social scientist at the RAND Corporation. Previously, Sean has worked in Africa for Dynacor International, a company that provides international security services. Prior to that, he was a U.S. Army officer, specifically a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne, where he served uh, in the Army for eight years. Dr. McFate has also been a fellow at the New American Foundation, an advisor to Amnesty International, the director of national security projects at the Bipartisan Policy Center, as well as vice president of TD International, which is a a political risk consulting firm. Sean is a graduate of Brown University. He also has a master's in public policy from the Harvard uh, Kennedy School of Government, as well as a PhD from the London School of Economics. He is gonna talk about his book, The Modern Mercenary, Private Armies and What They Mean for World Order. So for a discussion about the use of private military contractors in international conflicts, and the implications for global security, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean McFate. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, the World Affairs Council, and thank you, uh, all the hosts of this magnificent event. Um, 2004, 10 years ago, I sat across the table from the president of Burundi and the U.S. ambassador to Burundi. Burundi is a very small country in the middle of what is called the Great Lakes region of Africa. And in 1994, the Rwandan genocide swept through Burundi, which is neighboring to Rwanda, as well as the eastern Congo and the western tip of Uganda. The entire region was subsumed in a genocide where 800,000 people were killed in 90 days. 10 years later, a Hutu extremist group called the FNL, which hit out in the lawlessness of Kivus, which was sort of think of El Paso in the 1870s, in the Western Congo, a sponge of badness. They were going to cross the border, which is 20 clicks from the capital of Burundi, and assassinate the president of Burundi. The intent, of course, was that his assassination would re-trigger the genocide of 1994 with revenge killings of Hutu and Tutsi. This was their mission. And the US government wanted to stop this without having US fingerprints on the operation, which itself could trigger political violence. So my job was to make this not happen. My job was to help prevent a genocide with other people. I was not a member of the armed forces. I was not a member of the CIA. I worked for a company. That company was called DynCorp International. And this is how foreign policy is increasingly carried out today, through corporations, not just military and intelligence organizations. It was from that experience that I decided that I wanted to think more deeply about what this meant going forward as a trend in the 21st century. And by the way, we were successful. We helped prevent, I believe, a genocide from taking place. An attempt was made on the, on the president's life. It was rebuffed by Burundian soldiers successfully, and the president stood for election and lost. Um, but the fact that he stood for election was pretty amazing in Burundi. And, and, but it's deeply disturbing some of the bigger aspects of linking profit motive with foreign policy, especially when it comes to warfare and killing often thought as inherently governmental. And that is why I wrote this book called The Modern Mercenary. So before we continue with that, I would like to talk about a few disruptive facts from a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan regarding contractors. So in 2010, just to give you some scope of this industry, 
the Pentagon spent $366 billion were obligated to contracts. That's 54% of DOD budget. And that's seven times the UK's Ministry of Defense budget. And that's just one department. The Department of State is also a huge consumer of contractors. Now, of those contractors, now a multi-billion dollar industry, um, the amount that was armed is only about 10 to 12 percent. Only 10 to 12 percent were armed. So you think of Blackwater and Nisor Square in 2007, where Blackwater guards killed 17 Iraqi civilians. That was only about a minority of contractors. Most contractors do very mundane things like cook chow and fix vehicles and build buildings, et cetera. Um, but about you know, 10 to 15 either kill or train others to kill. And this is the group that I focus on in this book, which I call private military companies, PMCs. However, don't let numbers fool you. Mistakes by armed contractors have outsized strategic proportions and outcomes. So when that group of, you know, a squad size element of Blackwater killed Iraqi civilians, it created a firestorm of anti-American sentiment throughout the Middle East, not just Iraq, that severely compromised the, you know, the, the growing hearts and minds campaign of counterinsurgency. It was so bad that the Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, had to apologize publicly to Iraq and had to answer tough questions in front of Congress and having several, you know, an FBI investigation, several investigations. Those contractors were just found guilty in November, you know, you know several years later, um, and we'll see what happens uh, if that continues, the court is, the case is on appeal. So private military companies, although a minority, have a huge proportional impact. Another aspect is that contractors are, do more dying than troops now. So in the beginning of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, troops were, U.S. government troops, we're taking 90% of the casualties. By 2010, that number flipped. And if there's a, there's a chart in the book that shows the gradual uh, you know, decrease of troops getting killed and increase of contractors getting killed. Lastly, in Iraq, over 50% of the force structure was contracted, 50%. That means there was a one-to-one -one ratio between troops and contractors. In Afghanistan, it was closer to 70%. Over half of the U.S. force structure was contracted, raising questions as America dependent on contractors to wage wars and, and sustain wars. One of the questions I get when I talk to foreign reporters is, well, next war, will America have 80% contractors, 90% contractors? Will America be fighting its wars with contracted militaries? We can return to that question in Q&A. One question is, how did this happen? How did half of the force structure become contracted? Well, it happened very simply. When, the pol when policymakers took the decision to go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan, they did not envision, for whatever reason, that this would be two long wars. And they quickly realized that the all-volunteer force could not sustain and recruit enough volunteers to fill all of the billets. So they had some pretty terrible policy decisions in front of them. The first was withdraw, which would have been politically unviable. Premature uh, leaving Iraq and Afghanistan. The second was to assume that allies would fill all gaps, which is an unreasonable assumption. The third option is to have a national conscription, a national draft like Vietnam, to fill all the billets. That would have been political suicide. The fourth option was simply to contract out the difference, which is what they did. There is strong uh, bipartisan support in Capitol Hill for this, um, one of the few things. Now, there are several reasons why this is good and bad, and we can save some of these for discussion, but contractors um, do some things really well. Uh, and then there's some other issues about linking profit motive with killing that are very disturbing ethically and otherwise. We can save that for Q&A. What I really want to discuss tonight is the future.
What does the future look like? Especially because in the United States of America, we tend to be very, um, sort of we look about our own interests, but there, there's a movement afoot internationally that I want to bring attention to in this book and discuss tonight. So there are four trends. First of all, the first trend is resiliency. Multi-billion dollar industries do not evaporate overnight. They look for new clients, and that is going on today. So rather than, you know, we have a national, a national military model that when wars are done in Iraq and Afghanistan, like Vietnam, they come home and they demobilize. For some reason, policymakers think that this industry will simply do the same thing, it'll go bankrupt. It's not, it's looking for new customers. Which leads to the second trend. The industry is becoming more international and it's proliferating. Prior to, you know, the last 10 years, the US has been the primary consumer. But now it's no longer the primary consumer. Now it's a much more of a, a free market. So companies that once worked just for the US government are, looking, are now working for oil companies, they're working for humanitarian organizations. Um, they're working for all sorts of people. We don't even know who they are. Also, other countries are using them. Putin is allegedly using Chechen mercenaries in eastern Ukraine. We are seeing Nigeria hiring mercenaries out of South Africa and parts of the Soviet, former Soviet republics to, to kill and go after Boko Haram. And by press reports, they are succeeding. We are starting to see also Latin American ex-Special Forces soldiers show up in Abu Dhabi and the Gulf states, doing we don't know what, uh, working for the Gulf states. We're, we see contractors, armed contractors, and herbal in, in Iraq, defending oil company assets. So we're seeing a lot of contractor activity, and these are not, again, the book is not about contractors who cook soup. It's about armed contractors or those who, who train uh, armed contractors. We're seeing them everywhere. We're seeing also them proliferate amongst other domains of warfare. So not just the land domain, but also sea. We're seeing uh, ar arsenal ships sitting off the coast of Somalia and the Gulf of Guinea in Africa that, are at, that protect freighters from pirates. And the way this works is that you have an armory ship with, it's an arsenal with armed contractors, and if you have a freighter going through pirate waters, they will helicopter that security called embark security and put them on your freighter. And they will defend the freighter with firearms until you're through pirate waters and then they get helicoptered back to the arsenal ship. We're starting to see um, contractors use drones, unarmed drones, not the expensive predator types, but cheap ones that you can get online. It wouldn't take much to make them suicide kamikaze drones. Um, we haven't seen contractors go to space, uh, although space is privatized, it begin to privatize as SpaceX. But in the fifth domain of warfare, cyber, we see mercenaries there in this thing called hackback companies. And the way that works is if you're, a if you're like your Anthem insurance company, or you're a competitive Anthem, and you just saw Anthem insurance um, get hacked, uh, you know, causing them great distress, and you're like, well, I don't want that to happen to my company. Current US law does not allow companies to play offense in this country. You can't go after hackers. So some companies have thought about hiring offshore hackers to hack the hackers that attack them. Not to get back their lost information, but to, to frankly whack them, and hopefully, hopefully that'll be deterrent. So if, if you have hackers from Russia or China looking at your company and they know that you have a hackback company behind you, maybe they'll pass over you and go to somebody else. So we're seeing it proliferate. At the same time, the third trend is we're seeing it go native. It's indigenizing. Warlords in Somalia and Afghanistan and other places are now fashioning themselves as private military companies and selling their services, their militia, to companies, to humanitarian organizations, to the US Army. The US Army, in fact, hired warlords in 2010 to protect uh, convoy resupply right, routes in Afghanistan. Um, which leads to the fourth and final trend. We are now um, at a precipice in the world right now. There are two different types of, of these companies in the book. There are what I call military enterprisers, which are not mercenaries. These are companies like DynCorp and Blackwater and Triple Canopy and others who they don't 
they don't deploy armies, they don't deploy private armies, they augment big national armies. And they train other armies, like the Iraqi army. But they themselves do not have offensive capability, um, they themselves do not wage war independently, they don't do maneuver operations, et cetera. They augment a strong army and they work in a public-private partnership with those companies, with, sorry, with those governments. And they can do a lot of good, especially for stability operations. So that when we think of contractors in Afghanistan, that's, that's what they are, military enterprisers. It's a term that comes from the Thirty Years' War. There's a precedent for this in history. Now, the other alternative, the other crossway, are mercenaries. Mercenaries are what we see, when you think of mercenaries, exactly what you think of, right? These are for-profit, private actors who can wage war. It's what Nigeria is hired to do uh, in, against Boko Haram, allegedly. Um, these companies can do fully automated military maneuver operations. Um, and they are, they are less fickle. They don't have a private-public partnership with anybody. It's a true free market for force, a free market for force. And that is, if left on autopilot, that is where we're heading. Now, let's move forward. What might that world look like? Just say nothing was done. Uh, just say you tried regulation, but that just moved private military companies offshore. Um, or we just didn't care. Things happen, right? Well, the world that it would turn into would look very old indeed. It would look like the Middle Ages. Because contract warfare, mercenaries, it, that's not a new thing. Most of military history is privatized. And we have to think about what that would do. Because right now we live in a world where states nominally should have the monopoly of force. But if force becomes a commodity, if conflict becomes a commodity, and mercenaries appear, and anybody who can afford the means of war could wage it for whatever reason they wanted to, we're going to have more war. Not World War II and III, but low, these low-grade persistent wars that never seem to end. Also, mercenaries are a commodity where they can create their own demand. They can engage in racketeering. They can go up to a, a city and say, you know, give us all of your gold or, and we won't sack you this month, as they happened in the Middle Ages. Um, they, can, they can, when out of work or unsupervised mercenaries, become predators, become brigands or become pirates if they're Navy privateers, pirates of the Caribbean um, in, the, in the 1600s. Um, so this world that, that, we, that I, just, I lay out in the end of the book is a, sort of a, a, what I call durable disorder. It's a world order that can, can, that can contain problems but not resolve them. The world will continue. It's not going to become Armageddon, but it's become much more disorderly. And we're already seeing this, you might argue, in Iraq right now, as it sort of arguably balkanizes. And we're not sure who's going to step in that vacuum. So in this world order, which I call neo-medievalism, because it sort of looks like the medieval order, we're going to the status quo ante of the Westphalian order of today of states, state centricity. We're going to see a commodification of violence, where anybody who can afford the means of war can wage it. We're going to see more mercenaries emerge. We're going to see new consumers emerge. Um, anybody who's very wealthy, it could be powerful corporations, it could be oligarchs, they're going to be new consumers of this force, of this, you know, any, like an armed corporation. We're going to have contract warfare. It's like contract killing, but with armies or navies. And lastly, and most importantly, this is a world that will have more war in it. You're taking an industry invested in conflict, and it's going to go to the most conflict-prone places in the planet. And who's going to stop that? The United Nations, the US, is the US stepping in right now in Nigeria? No. People are watching Nigeria very closely because if, if it succeeds, then somebody might hire mercenaries to, to go after Al-Shabaab. Or Al-Shabaab might hire them to go after somebody else, Uganda. So we will, we will wait and see how this unfolds, but the purpose of the book is to raise some alarm in a, in a non-reckless way and also look at some of the good things that, that th this industry does. For example, they could augment UN peacekeeping operations if done well. Um, but bring attention to it and to sort of say, we're, we're beyond Afghanistan, we're beyond Iraq. Uh, this is something that should concern all of us. Thank you very much. Sean, thank you for that uh, presentation.
the, the first question I'd like to ask is one of accountability. You mentioned briefly uh, that the contractors work for governments, but when they go to a conflict zone or they're in a, a foreign country merely training other forces, to whom do they report and to whom are they accountable and what are the lines of communication across boundary? And as uh, someone who served in Iraq, I remember often being frustrated by contractor entities that were moving through uh, areas that we were responsible for and maybe not knowing that they were gonna be there or uh, finding out after the fact that they had transited through an area. Where is the accountability and what are the responsibilities for coordinating with uh, other entities in a battle space? Uh, great question. You know, after 10 years of war, this question still comes up. Um, after Nisor Square, when Blackwater uh, killed Iraqi civilians, uh, Eric Prince, the founder and the head of Blackwater, uh, testified before Congress, was asked to testify before Congress. And um, a congressman asked him this very same question. And his, his response to the question of, like, what happens to contractors who kill civilians in the battlefield? Uh, well, we know what, hap what happened to a Marine, right? You would, you know, off to the brig, right? Um, his response is they get aisle or window. They go home. Nothing happens to them. Um, disturbing, right? Especially since a lot of locals can't tell the difference between a contractor and a Marine, uh, which is another issue. So the truth is, is that um, after 10 years of war, there is still no real good accountability. In some ways, the private military industry is more opaque than the Pentagon and the CIA. The Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and the CIA have to answer to congressional committees. Some of those are public, some are not public. There's no such oversight committee for this industry. Um, if you're a journalist or a researcher, you can do a Freedom of Information Act to the federal government to ask for data. The federal government doesn't have to give you that data, but they have to respond and sometimes they give you that data. If you knock on the door of a private corporation, a private military corporation, um, they tell you to buzz off. They would say all this information is proprietary and we don't need to share it with you and it doesn't help us win new contracts to share it to you, a journalist, for example. Um, that's partly why as a former industry insider, I wanted to share this and this deeply influenced the book. I was no longer beholden to the industry and had some insights about how the industry really functions. Um, there, are current, there are some attempts to have regulation in the world today, but the problem is about regulation is, one, if you regulate too hard, they're gonna just move offshore. Two, um, just say that, you, like, who are, who are the people in Nigeria, Ukraine? We don't know. And if you send the world police after them, quote unquote, um, the world police might get shot by them. So it's really hard to enforce regulation. And if we're gonna wait for a Geneva Protocol, we might be waiting a very long time. So uh, I propose a way of regulating the industry is actually using market forces to do it, incentivize good behavior, disincentivize bad behavior. I lay out some ideas in the book on how to do that. Sean, one of the things I was really interested in as I was reading your book, that in 2008, Congress established the Commission on Wartime Contracting to examine contract spending, especially from the US government, Department of Defense, Department of State, and others. Uh, the result that you quoted in your book from that uh, commission was that at least $31 billion, and possibly as much as $60 billion, were lost due to contract waste, fraud, and abuse. Can you comment on that piece? I think that's really important as we look at uh, uh, fiscal constraints to DOD especially. Yes, there's been several uh, special investigators. Uh, the special investigator for Iraq reconstruction in, in both, there's one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, found multiple uh, questions of fraud, waste, and abuse. Now this doesn't mean just the private military industry, which is only like a very small portion, like 10 to 15 percent. This is all contractors. Um, and one of the things that the U.S. government, uh, in my opinion, was unable to do is that, you know, nobody in 2003 envisioned this, this ex literally an explosion of contractors in war zones. The U.S. bureaucracy to oversee these contractors could not grow at a commensurate rate. And so a lot of that is due to legitimate, not legitimate, fraud, waste, and abuse, and some of it is due just, we need more oversight. 
a, a similar question in terms of contracting, and we realize this is an international and it's an expanding phenomenon as, as you uh, just told us, but what are, what are the average wages of a mercenary or a contractor going to a combat zone? And are we depleting our military forces by having a more uh, financially attractive alternative for members of our military, maybe to join uh, one of these privatized uh, military companies? Um, so looking back in my privatized military, my private warrior days, um, my salary was, was better than make, being an O3 in the U.S. Army, a captain in the U.S. Army, uh, but not by much. I mean, look also what I was giving up. I was giving up retirement, pension, job security. One of the questions that we could even get into is like, what happens to wounded contractors when they come home? There's no VA for them. Uh, in the U.S., they get absorbed into the system, right? And there's other problems, you know, PTSD, et cetera. Um, so the pay and benefits, despite some media reporting, is not that great. I mean, in the beginning of the wars, if you were like SEAL Team 6 or something, yes, it was, people would pay a lot for you. Um, but over, and that, and that created a lot initially in the beginning of those wars, it created what they call a gun drain. Uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen, et cetera, they were leaving elite units to work for Blackwater Triple Canopy, creating a gun drain. Now, that certain bubble ended around 2005, more or less. You know, all the, basically all the warriors who wanted to do that had done that. But then we started seeing gun drains from around the world. Like the Colombian Special Forces would, you know, they hang up the, you know, say, I'm out of the army, I'm gonna go to Iraq and I'm gonna work for this company. So the gun drain is actually international. Do you think that for-profit private military contractors encourage or prolong conflict? You mentioned that it's international. So conceivably you could have a Western nation funding one side of a conflict and maybe a, uh, a, a Russian or a Chinese entity funding another side of a contract and, and, and of a conflict. And both of these uh, private companies would see it in, in their best interest to prolong that conflict, whereas we all look at warfare as something that you want to start and end as quickly as possible. With private armies involved, quite the opposite seems like it could be true. That's right. So um, one of the more disturbing aspects of this industry that is shared today as it was a thousand years ago in the Middle Ages is that linking profit motive with warfare encourages war. It encourages companies to expand and elongate conflicts. It encourages them in some cases to start conflicts. Now we have not seen that recently, but historically we have a lot of precedent in the Middle Ages for that. Uh, and this is one of the chief concerns. Uh, absolutely. I think there, we'll, we'll see more war left, left unattended. One of the questions from the audience talks about how did this private contracting start in America? And you really looked far back in history, but as I look at the United States, uh, the, the British in the American Revolution had Hessian troops on, on U.S. soil, a form of a private contractor uh, at that time. And you also mentioned the, the Flying Tigers, that in World War II we had American pilots that were on a separate payroll that flew out of Burma against the Japanese in China. There are some really intriguing uh, examples of this, both on a negative side and a positive side. Can you comment on the history of this going back in our national history? Sure, so we've seen a lot of private force. Um, but you know, if you look at like the last thousand years, you know, a thousand years ago, using mercenaries, that's actually how war was fought. Everybody who could afford mercenaries would fight them, because it's, it's cheaper, right? It's like renting a car versus owning one. It's cheaper to, to rent than to own. And everybody did this. The popes did this. The Vatican did this. The papacy uh, did this. Our rich families did this. And over time, after around the Thirty Years' War, 1640s, 1650s, um, n leaders of nations thought mercenaries are too destructive. So they started to gradually monopolize the market for force, literally. And they had national armies, and they outlawed mercenaries, could, could threaten their existence. And, but they, they traded amongst each other. They said, okay, King George, you can rent a regiment. We have rental regiments in Hess. Take one or two. I mean, we'll cut you a deal. Um, and that's sort of how King George III surged to put down an insurgency in the United States of America. 
that point, colonies. Um, the U.S. also, as well as the U.K., the SAS, did basically um, sort of, they had, uh, you know, soldiers, you know, not officially soldiers, but working for U.S. interests, like the Flying Tigers. They're not really exactly free market actors. But this started to reemerge re after the Cold War. Um, when, you know, Matt, you look in the 1970s and 80s, Maggie Thatcher, Ronald Reagan began this move that well, we'll start outsourcing government. It'll be cheaper this way. Government's more clever, they're more innovative, it'll make more efficiencies. At that time, nobody envisioned outsourcing firepower, but gradually, that's what happened. Uh, and of course, then in 2003, 2004, 2005, they had a, a manpower crisis in, in the United States government, and they had to fill it. As, as a young uh, captain, I remember commanding a headquarters company in which I had uh, cooks, I had a lot of administration marines, I had uh, a lot uh, of mechanics, and you know, we had a lot of capabilities inherent in the military uh, when I was a junior officer. Ten years later as a field grade officer, many of those functions, those support functions, became privatized, and, and I always wondered in, in seeking efficiency, did we really lose a capability that will be really hard to get back? All those different positions became contracted. So was it an effect that we gave up the, these capabilities out of our active force that made us need contractors? Or is our military just not adapting uh, enough to the battlefield and being flexible enough to a, a new type of warfare that there is such a reliance on these private military companies? Well, in, you know, in 2000, 2001, Rumsfeld went on record by saying, why are we, why are we training soldier, uh, Marines at Paris Island to become cooks? What a waste. Let's contract that out. And, we'll, we'll, you know, and let's, let's war fighters be war fighters. And, uh, and let's have a more like a hybrid you know, military, if you will. Um, that did, of course, not envision what, what eventually became what we see today. But one area that does concern me, I think we could you know, make uh, Marines and soldiers into cooks if we needed to. But one area is stability operations, like counterinsurgency, et cetera. We now know that you know, winning wars on battlefields like Waterloo and Midway doesn't occur that often. Regular war, as we think about it, hasn't really occurred in, you know, since World War II, maybe the Korean War. Um, now wars seem to be fought and won in what they call phase zero and phase four operations in military parlance, in, in sort of like the post-conflict phase and the pre-conflict phase. And guess what? That's mostly the domain of contractors. So they may have critical skills necessary for victory that are under protected by proprietary knowledge. Are we in a catch-22 situation? If we try to regulate these military contractors uh, this could backfire in the sense that most of these companies would be driven offshore. There will always be a demand, there will always be a, a need for these types of organizations. So what is your view of the future in terms of the U.S.? Should we try to regulate this, or is this just a fact of life and we have to embrace it and do our best with it? Well, I think um, the time for the U.S. to regulate it or to expunge industry has passed. I think, at the, as they say, the, the, hor the horse has fled the barn. Um, you know, the other thing about the industry is, when I was in the industry, you know, we think of it as, oh, these are American companies, and they must be full of Americans. That's not true. Their, hire, their headquarters are based in America, that's true. Their C-suite, the CEO, the CFO, they're American. The high, high, senior leadership is American. But these are multinational corporations. Everybody else, sort of middle and lower ranks, are not American. They're from all over the place. I was, I was working next to people from Mexico, from Ghana, uh, from the Philippines, you name it. These are multinational corporations. Um, and so what happens to those people when the contract ends is they go home. And some might create their own military, not, you know, private military companies. Um, also, you know, these companies create what they call subs or subcontractors. So, for example, Armor Group went to, uh, went to Afghanistan, and they had to, to protect parts of Kabul, and uh, they didn't have enough people, so they sort of created or hired a local private military company. Um, now, what happens to that private military company when Armor Group loses the contract and goes home? Well, that little company stays in place and looks for new clients. 
So I think the chance for the U.S. to do something about it, unless it decides to go big and use its market power, is low. I think the U.N., um, all while I may be dubious about my optimism there, could do it if it decides to privatize peacekeeping, if it did it under a certain type of regime and regulation. The, these international situations, these international conflicts get very convoluted. You mentioned that uh, Russia might be hiring Chechens to fight in the Ukraine. That Chechens aren't really the friends of the Russians. They've had long conflicts uh, in that region. At the same time, you look at the, the, the failed state of Syria and you look at the failed state of Iraq currently, or parts of Iraq, and to the casual observer, it looks like Western powers are financing Iranian-backed Shia militias to fight against Sunni extremists. Again, not natural alliances. Is this something that we're going to see more of in the future? Well, it's interesting you should ask. I mean, so the Chechen, the alleged Chechen mercenaries are pro-Russians. So they fought on the side of Russia during the, the, the war there. Um, but we don't know who's floating around Syria. Um, and one of the questions now, too, is, you know, would the U.S. turn to this industry to help professionalize and harden the Iraqi security forces, something that they've done before and can do fairly well. Um, so I, I think the, the more important thing is, is the fact that Russia is now using them, Nigeria is now using them. There's no norm now prohibiting mercenaries, as there was for a couple hundred years. Um, and so anybody who wants to use them can use them, and the U.S. really can't say, don't do that. You know, that's bad. You mentioned in your book uh, Rwanda and the genocide that happened there. Part of what you explained in your book was the story that there was a private contracting firm that the UN was actually considering uh, using to prevent that genocide. And I think your assertion was that that might have actually worked and it would have been a, a very good use of a privatized army. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Sure. So <clears throat> lots happens in Rwanda, apparently, for the private military industry. Um, so. April of 1994, as the Rwanda, the earliest days of Rwanda, the outbreak uh, of genocide, and uh, the UN, um, they were approached by a company called Executive Outcomes. Executive Outcomes is a South African company, a true mercenary corporation that appeared after apartheid. It's now defunct, but they are a mercenary. They could wade, they're a private army, they have hind helicopters, they have everything. And they went to the head of UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and they asked the head of it, who at that point was Kofi Annan, who later became Secretary General, um, said, look, for $120 million, we can buy you some precious time. We can create islands of humanity in Rwanda where we allow civilians in and we'll keep the genocide years out. We'll do this, you know, and it, it'll take you six months to create a, a full-on UN mission to intervene, but they said by that time, it'll be over. And Kofi Annan infamously said, no, thank you. He said the reason why is that the world was not ready to privatize peacekeeping. But of course, the irony is that the world wasn't ready for 800,000 people to get killed in 90 days. So it's a very expensive ideology. You talked a little bit about the expansion of the industry going to naval forces to protect merchant ships from pirates. We talked briefly about drones. What about the proliferation of weapons and the increasing size and lethality? You know, is it even conceivable that you could have a, a weapon of, of mass destruction within the hands of a private uh, army? And you know, certainly in, in the Western countries, there would be controls on that, but do you see that as something that could proliferate in the future? Um, well, this is everybody's nightmare, right? Uh, private, anybody who gets a weapon of mass destruction and makes a nuclear, uh, you know, car bomb, um, and certainly in the hands of a private military actor, of course. Um, my, it's hard to read in the, the crystal ball. I'd see that as being kind of unlikely right now because the controls on WMD, especially nuclear ones, are so... Uh, they're, they're relatively tight, they're very tight. However, the idea of this industry mixing together with the small arms and light weapons industry can only be a boon for both industries. One of the questions from the audience addresses the, the concept of nation building. Uh, 
And most of the places that we try to do nation building are dangerous places, they're conflict-ridden places. What about the roles of the private uh, military companies in not just providing security for, but also the means with which to rebuild countries, economies, and infrastructure during and post-conflict? So this is, I think, the, the true you know, revenue stream of the private military industry right now. Leaving aside, let's leave aside mercenaries like Nigeria, but like look at the companies that work for the U.S. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, they can generally do this cheap, more cheaply, and arguably better than um, than the U.S. You know, Army, for example. Um, and I think this is an area that they 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 could provide uh, some some contribution if there was appropriate sort of oversight, right? Um, so, you know, for example, when I was in Liberia, I was part of a, of a, comp I was part of a company that, that raised Liberia's army. And Liberia's army today, for those who know, it's a small West African country that suffered 14 years of terrible civil war under Charles Taylor. Blood diamonds, child soldiers, human rights violations of every manner took place there. It, it makes Afghanistan look relatively civil. Um, and in, after Charles Terrell left in 2003, um, the U.S. government paid for, paid a private company to raise an army, de demobilize Charles Taylor's army and raise a new one in Toto. It's the first time in about 150 years that one sovereign nation raised another sovereign nation's armed forces completely uh, through a private company. And that, comp and, and that, today is Liberia's military is completely a private sector product. And it's, it's doing relatively well. I mean, they sent a contingent to Mali for peacekeeping. Uh, they helped out in the Ebola crisis. Um, this might be a, a low bar, but they haven't taken over the government at all. And they didn't run away. Yes, I know. Um, they, and they, you know, importantly, they didn't run away uh, you know, from the enemy dropping their weapons and taking off their, their uh, uniforms, as we've seen recently in the last year in uh, places like Mosul. So I think... Uh, Liberia gets a lot of credit for that, but I think the industry does too. You spent uh, quite a bit of time in Liberia, and I, in your book you talk about your experience there, and you also mentioned that at the end of the mission of DynCorp, who you were working with, there was a marine advisory group then that took over. Can you talk about the transition again? How do you go from a privatized uh, organization, building, manning, equipping an army, and then handing it over to a much smaller, uh, maybe less equipped, but again, handing it back over to uh, U.S. government, Department of Defense, specifically U.S. Marine Forces. Mm. So um, the way that was, I wasn't there for the handoff. The way it was supposed to work is that the, the two contractors, DynCorp International and PA&E, Pacific Architects and Engineer, was, was to raise this military, working in close, you know, in partnership with the US, Liberian government. And then once it was sort of, you know, upright, maybe not 100% functional, but upright, you know, hand it to the Liberians. And then, um, and at that point, Marines came, like a small detachment, just to do some training, you know, like mentoring and advising on a, in a, in a temporary basis. Um, and I think, you know, that was important because, you know, if you're a national army, nothing seals your peerdom as working side by side with U.S. Marines, U.S. Army, et cetera. So that was a key, and of course the training they, they conveyed. But it really, it was sort of an apples and oranges thing though. The contractors left and said, here's the army, um, you know, good luck with it. One of the questions talks about you know, using contracts might be a way for a government to hide the cost of going to war. You discussed this a little bit also. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How, how is that done, and how, how can that be sustained in an open society like ours that has a, a free press and, and pretty robust auditing skills? Well, as was said uh, you know, during the, in the 70s, uh, the Pentagon Papers, et cetera, that secrets of democracy do not mix very well. Um, one of the reasons why, in my opinion, the industry has not been heavily regulated by the U.S. government is because it provides a great deal of utility to policymakers. Um, so it creates actually moral hazard in policymaking. It's like drones. 
you can have bloodless wars through contractors and drones. You don't have to have a national draft. So if you have an unpopular war that you want to sustain, um, one way to do it is to have contractors and, and drones do, for example, do a lot of the fighting for you. Because the American public doesn't seem to care that much about dead contractors where they really do care about dead Marines. Or captured Marines versus captured contractors. Um, and so this is a way to hide the political costs of going to war. And of course, in terms of the financial costs, as we've seen from the various uh, investigations and commissions, there's been a lot of fraud, waste, and abuse by contractors. To be fair, some of it, you know, they're, they're operating in, in difficult places. Um, it's not like building a building here in San Francisco. You're, you know, under fire. All these things could happen. But there's been a lot of at least questionable things that's happened. Um, so in many ways, it lowers the barriers of, of entry to conflict because you don't have pure transparency as to what this U.S. is getting into. So it sort of has been argued circumvents some democratic principles. In chapters two and three of your book, you, you really lay out some nice charts and graphs. And you mentioned this also in your talk, that half of U.S. personnel in Iraq and in Afghanistan are civilian contractors. What functional areas are they in? And you break this down in a pie chart in terms of they fill all kinds of different roles from logistics support to intelligence to interpreter translators. Um, can we wage war effectively ever again in the future without half of our force being civilian contractors? Well, the fact that 50% of the force structure was contracted suggests the answer is no, right? I mean, if it was 10% or 7%, we could probably get away with it. But 50%. And the, the fact is also is that the military has stopped training a lot of these functions. Uh, they, they focus on the like, combat arms, uh, which is the most appropriate area to focus on, but it's not like World War II where everybody was committed. Um, so one of my, one of the, if you will, red flags in the book is to suggest that the U.S. is now dependent on the private sector to wage sustained wars. The U.S. is reliant on contractors then, that is your opinion, to wage war. Uh, some, and, and again, I think this is a quote from your book, that some will await the day when the United Nations hires qualified PMCs as peacekeepers. And what you wrote was a rational choice given that peacekeeping needs rise each year while national troops available for such missions dwindle. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, there's one big caveat to that, which is accountability, et cetera. Um, but right now, the UN, you know, if UN, UN, every year there's more UN peacekeeping missions and there's not enough blue helmets to, to sustain them. Uh, blue helmets are peacekeepers. Uh, one way to augment them is to use military enterprisers, not mercenaries, the ones that work in a public-private partnership, who are pre-vetted, who meet certain criterion for training, for equipping, for standards, for, for rules of conduct, for human rights understanding, et cetera. And that there, and to sort of, to be privileged to be up for a UN peacekeeping mission means you have to go through this onerous oversight, uh, including spot checks, as we would say in the military. Um, and then one of the things that, you know, there's at least two things that the industry could, well, could offer a couple things. First of all, it offers specialized skills. Um, you know, if you need a you know, special type of intelligence done, or special, that, you know, it could do it. And whereas relying on the Nigerian military may not fulfill that need. The second thing is it augments thinning peacekeeping operations, like Sudan. Um, and the third, you know, is that it offers a surge capacity. There's no sort of quick reaction force in the UN, despite Rwanda and the attempts post-Rwanda to do this. Uh, they could do this. Um, the question is, is there political will in the UN to do this? And that's a, it's a hot debate. Um, and the second is, even if the UN wanted to do this, could its bureaucracy manage it? And that's another question entirely. Sean, at, at what level in the government is the decision made that we're gonna use conventional US forces or special forces or an instrument of national power, or we're gonna contract 
something out? And is there a monetary threshold that if something costs more than $5 million or $10 million, it's at a secretary or an undersecretary level? And what, at what level do those decisions go all the way to the top of our government to, to the White House? And that's a great question. And I think it depends on the White House. Um, but I don't see it, the, the, re, the decision to not, you know, to use contractors versus special forces is not a monetary one, but a political one. I don't think our Pentagon worries about how much a, an alpha team would cost versus contractors. Um, that would be less than a rounding error in the DOD budget. Um, what does concern me uh, is, I mean, I don't think that the U.S. government will ever really outsource combat operations. Um, unless it was very desperate, it'd be like a fixed bayonets moment for the country. Um, but um, I think other countries are doing that right now. Nigeria is an example. So even though the U.S. might not do it, I think other countries will begin to do that uh, much more frequently. What is the fastest growing area for private military contractors? I think conventional forces, as you mentioned, uh, a Colombian soldier who decides to join an organization uh, where he uses his infantry skills or special forces skills as one entity. The, the one that intrigued me is the one that I would think naturally is the fastest expanding, and that's this hack back uh, cyber entity of private military contractor. When you have the skills to be able to attack the hacker or uh, counterattack a hacker, I think that's probably one of the most powerful tools that you mention in your book. So right now, of course, U.S. law prohibits, uh, you know, companies here, I'm talking about like Walmart, can only play defense in cyber warfare. They can't play offense. And, um, and that becomes a problem, especially as we've seen recently. Um, so cyber, you know, having like cyber mercenaries, these are not like, you know, these are not private military companies operating in Iraq. These are cyber companies who act like mercenaries. Um, could be a, a growing, growing uh, industry indeed. Uh, because if, if, if it acts as a deterrent, I think a company is willing to, to invest the money, uh, millions, of, if it saves them a billion, they'd invest a few million to do so. In your book, you talked about neo-medievalism and you also mentioned it uh, earlier. What, what, are, what were you, to you the most important examples out of, you know, uh, European history that made you make that connection with now? Mm. So I call neo-medievalism because the world order that we're going back to is the status quo ante of the one we have right now, which is a world where, you know, right now the Westphalian model is state-centric. In the medieval model, the, nobody, it, was a, it was a big mess. It was like a bar brawl. Uh, no, anybody who had power could be a, a great power. Um, and back then, mercenaries, using mercenaries, uh, or, you know, was no different, you know, they were called contractors. They're called condottieri, contractor. They formed companies, like our, pri our like modern companies that were multinational, multi-ethnic. Um, they, hiring them was no different than hiring a contractor to dig your moat or to fix your castle wall. It's what was done. And contract warfare uh, is an interesting type of warfare that responds to the logic of the marketplace. So for example, um, if you're Florence and you want to take over Pisa, another city-state, you would go and you'd, you know, first thing you'd do is you'd hire all the mercenaries around Pisa so that Pisa was defenseless, because Pisa, nobody has a standing army, it's too expensive. But then Pisa then pays off half of your mercenary companies to not show up during the battle, right? This happened when Machiavelli was the Secretary of Defense, if you will, for Florence, which got him fired, which is why he's so angry in, in The Prince. He, he says mercenaries are faithless and terrible and blah, blah, blah. The fact is that mercenaries were used uh, throughout, the, throughout the Middle Ages, and um, his, he had a minority opinion, I'd say. Not to draw any comparisons between Machiavelli and any other politicians, <laughs> um, what is your opinion on the current state in the Middle East, and again, the, the, the two failed states that are in the news right now with, with Syria and with Iraq, is there a viable, privatized, mercenary solution 
uh, to this. It sounds like it would be appealing to a government that does not want to commit ground forces to the current conflict. Well, first, I'm not an expert in the Middle East or what's going on right now regarding ISIS uh, in Syria. I will say this, is that the balkanization, the destruction of Syria and Iraq and the regions around it point to durable disorder, as I've you know, wrote, written about a year ago uh, before the, all this broke out. Um, and I think you'll see a market for both military enterprisers and mercenaries develop. Military enterprisers, if the US and others want to train and equip the Iraqi security forces, one of the things about using private military companies is one, they have a skill set to do so, and two, you don't have to report them as boots on the ground to the American public, right? So again, we have this political moral hazard about using contractors. Now mercenaries, who knows, somebody might hire a group of mercenaries, and I think this Nigeria example right now is a test case. If Nigeria, the mercenaries in Nigeria successfully defeat or significantly hamper Boko Haram after the Nigerian military six years could not do it, you're gonna, and there's no international outrage, and so far there isn't, we might see people say, well, can we use this industry to go after Al-Shabaab? Can we use it then to go after ISIS in some capacity? I think it's inevitable that th people are thinking about this right now. So final question, and you know, I'll, I'll start with, with a statement. It sounds like from your research and from what you've told us, the, the privatization of war is changing warfare in the future. How do we as a nation or as Western nations factor this in in our strategic plans in, in terms of our military involvement for the future? That is a great question. So when you privatize war, it changes warfare. And it does it, uh, we have a new type of warfare on the planet that we haven't seen in several hundred years. And right now, all of our militaries, for example, the United States military is structured to fight other near peer nation states. Um, and it doesn't like to fight asymmetrical warfare, it wants to fight the Soviet Union, wants to fight you know, China if that's a threat. Uh, that's what it's structured to do, as is the State Department, as is the entire national security establishment. However, we're seeing around the globe a proliferation of armed non-state actors. Some are ideologically driven like ISIS, and some are monetarily driven like mercenaries as well as drug cartels. I would recommend strongly that we think about how we re-engage the world in the 21st century, which I say will look more like the 12th century than the 20th. Sean, I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much for coming.